lives in this research together and thinking of autonomy and its different uh, aspects, I'd say, it's really important for us because we see that autonomy is also in some salary job positions, but also in self-employed and a lot of very different situations in the grey zone in terms of employment, in terms of access to social protection, and in terms of support. In fact, uh, we believe that there's a kind of continuum between the salary classical employee with full access to social protection and the self-employed classic uh, professional liberal uh, image that we may have of them. And the fact that we look at not only um, their working conditions, but also um, the fiscal incentive, the social protection uh, issues, but also the aspirations of these workers, I think is very important because many actors uh, uh, have different views on what are the aspirations of workers. And of course, the question of choice, we see that choice is very prevalent. We also know that choices may also be linked to um, a, a binding situation linked to the job that you're actually having. So if you want to be an artist today, it's very difficult to be a salaried employee in an opera. And many musicians that have to create their own albums and, and produce before they sell. And so it's a whole different way of functioning compared to classic workers, let's say. Um, it's also interesting to see, in fact, all the diversity of actors that are surrounding and supporting in different ways uh, these autonomous workers. And I think this approach is very interesting as well. It's not only about the unions, it's not only about the labor intermediaries, it's also about kinds of unions and, uh, and social movements, which we hadn't seen at the beginning, but that popped up, which was really interesting. And the different way they support, and of course, this, we saw it when we tried to classify all these workers. It's very difficult to put one structure in, in, in one service because many do different types of services, advocacy, collective bargaining, and so on. And it was also interesting for us to see that uh, the image of these new forms of co-ops uh, are coming up as something new. These cooperatives of freelancers are a new image such as can be smart or can be activity in emploi and as also the um, SECOP report showed these types of co-ops of freelancers are really exploding worldwide. I mean, we've had people from Singapore come, come to see us to see how was this working and how could they do something similar in Singapore or, or in, in a, other continents actually. So we really see that there's really a, a will for workers to find structures, uh, bottom-up initiatives, structures that are uh, answering their needs but that are also co-built by them. And this is really what, uh, what SMART has been doing in becoming a co-op. We've always been a bottom-up initiative, but the fact that we've become a co-op has really allowed us to put really bluntly uh, outside that the people who work here are not only workers, they're also, also owners. They are autonomous, but they also want solidarity, and they do it through this cooperative, this shared enterprise. And SMART is one of those models, there are other models as well, and it's booming and I think it really should take our attention as to also how workers want to be represented and want to take part, not only be represented by others, but also take an active part and role in the way they structure their way of working and the way they self-organize. I think that's really important. And also that autonomy doesn't mean I want to be alone. It means I have skills that I want to be able to develop, but I also want to be able to work in teams, and I also want solidarity with other workers, and I want to be in contact with these other workers. A lot of people think that they are in competition. It's true, they are in competition, but they also learn a lot from exchanging with one another. So there's also a lot of cooperation, which is not much there in the literature, and I think it's something we should be digging into for more. So yes, the question of the aspiration of workers is also very important at different levels. Um, we are very happy that the analysis also, this will come up later, but I really want to stress this, how, what a bad idea third status is. <laughs> a bad idea is this third status, because these workers are juggling with different jobs, and they're also juggling with different social statuses, so just adding a new one is not going to help, uh, really. <laughs> it's just going to make things more complicated, so this is great news. As to the need for cooperation and coalition building between different types of partners, this is crucial. It really is. The thing is, it's not that easy, <laughs> especially when we're talking about these types of workers. Now, we see a big improvement of dialogue with unions and the uh, unions opening up to these, free, to these freelancers and autonomous workers, which is a great thing. But there is still, kind of often, there is still this vision of 
that these should be salaried workers? Or how can we apply the rules that would make more salaried workers to these workers? And, and you, you, we can't just transpose them to these workers because they have specificities. But we can think in terms of um, uh, functional equivalence. I think that is a very good and interesting way to, to do it. And it can be done in different ways. Uh, some by regulations, through, some through uh, structures um, that can provide some specific support. And on the other side, with the employers, it's sometimes difficult also because often what you hear from uh, employers organizations that are more with uh, high income uh, IT or high level professional, uh, high level income professionals, which are often classic uh, liberal professions, but not only. You have this vision of, oh, but if they can't make an earning, then they should just get a job. But there are not that many jobs out there either. So it's, it's a bit complex. And structures like us, where we're trying to find solutions the best as possible for these workers, but we're also struggling with a legislation that is not meant for us. And we're, we're, we know that we're kind of struggling to fit into the legislation to make, to do things well. But it's not easy when the, the problems we're addressed are not addressed by the legislation. So. I think it's really important that all these different organizations that we've been talking about all day long, um, labor market intermediaries, quasi-unions, unions, new social movement, new forms of co-ops, work together and try to understand, just like the union did back in the, at the beginning of the industrial times, what are the issues, what are the solutions that we can provide, and just forget initially what we think is good and just look at their situation and try to find solutions together that are new. And if we can find things that are adaptable from our scheme that is already there, that's great. But we have to be very inventive for many things if we want these workers to be truly protected, truly uh, recognized, and also to have a truly inclusive social protection model and labor market. And I think that is a crucial question, because otherwise we're just, as you said too, we're just creating this segmentation of people who are in or out, and it's, it just creates a situation in which we are now. So lower income, people are mad, they vote uh, <laughs> Uh, extreme right parties and then there's no more solidarity there. So it's really very urgent that we start really talking together and really trying to construct things together constructively instead of just looking at what the other is doing wrong. And this is the main message I would like to have <laughs> today. Of, of legitimacy. 
So um, this is probably one very important question because we have we have a lot of examples that Anna show us in the but one question fundamental question is how we measure the legitimacy of these new actors new players in the, in the social dialogue discourse so if you can add something on this topic as an expert of of the industrial relations system uh, well, it is actually, yeah, it is a complex, I think, question. Um, now, if you look literally at the uh, way how legitimacy is, is conceived, I think, well, maybe from, uh, from a statistical point of view, uh, well, you need to, you might think, to create indicators in that kind of respect, but the, the most important aspect to look at is, in fact, what these kind of uh, uh, actors that they represent certain groups, what do they deliver for them? Yeah? Uh, but when, then the question is, what is the quality of these uh, delivered goods? Yeah? So is, first of all, are these delivered goods what the represented ask for, first of all, the question, and the second is the quality. And I think that if it might be probably uh, simple to say, uh, okay, what do represented do they want, is getting a bit more difficult, I guess, when you are digging into the quality issue. Uh, because in fact it's very you know, individual based. But I think that is the challenge actually. Uh, because, uh, I mean, the major point is that, and this is in fact another thing that, by the way, Richard Nagel recalls uh, in a different way or from a different perspective, but I think this is much more actual today for self-employed. I mean, these are people, individual people. But then the question is that when you have to represent and you have to actually be legitimate, you have, you, well, first of all, you need to be a social actor, you need to be, a, and you need to have an institutional role in society, in other words, that's why Unions were actually claiming legitimacy eh? uh, uh, for subordinated workers. So the question would be for the labor market intermediates, how do we conceive them? Are they institutions, yes or no, and why? Well, probably yes. We talk about new institutions or new actors or industrial agents, but we have never actually also conceptualized that problem. Yeah? I mean, society is moving, but yeah, we still. So that's one question. Um, but going back to what I was saying before, so uh, again, I mean, if you get into this kind of um, uh, um, element here, so you have from one side individualism and on the other side a collectivism, and you need to construct a certain continuum there. In order to deliver, to be legitimate, to represent, you need to represent a collectivity. I mean, you need to represent people that they want the same thing, so that you can deliver to them the same thing. Then on the quality the side... The exactly. In their camp book, yeah, can be very helpful. Can be very helpful because you could achieve the institutional side at the same time you are uh, kind of linking with, in fact, more services or mutualistic perspective, for example, of smart rather than of other of these uh, new actors. So that could be a, a kind of more, what I would. Uh, see now, right now, as a more kind of feasible way to go, rather than in fact having on one side uh, one actor and the other side the other actor. So you need to put all people together to be able to represent. But nevertheless, so this kind of so this individualism vis-à-vis -vis collectivism nowadays in the self-employed, I would say that is much more kind of actual than it used to be because you really need to be. Uh, to create a continuum. These two cannot be seen anymore as extreme. They need to be put in a sort of continuum. And that's the challenge is how do you do that, considering the fact that these people, in fact, and this is not their own fault, I mean, they work, and that was also pointed out in the survey, you, you, yeah, you, you did it, I mean, they work at home, they do, you know, they, they, they do their own individual job, you know, fine. They just are, yeah, they are self-employed. To a certain end. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I just 
very much. Just add something about this question because we we were working on on smart as as Sarah know uh, in a paper published in the British Journal of Industrial Relations, and we were thinking about how new actors entering uh, the labor market field is building legitimacy, and we we use the institutionalist approach from mm -hmm. from Suchman, which is very helpful to to, to answer this kind of question. So it's, of course, as you have raised, a question of moral legitimacy. So how do you, you explain that you work for the general interest, how you build coalition with other partners and so on. It's also a question of pragmatic legitimacy. So you have to answer immediate needs, uh, deliver services, and so on. And it's also something else that was not mentioned. It's a question of cognitive legitimacy. Cognitive legitimacy. So building a new, a, a new, uh, I would say, new conceptual categories that can help the, the different stakeholders to think about the new reality. And I think it's very important to, for for, uh, 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 for gaining legitimacy. It's uh, to, to to think out of the box and to, and to bring new conceptual categories. Uh, in order to, to cross uh, yes. the, the boundaries. Uh, but that's perfectly in line with what you said. No, but then, oh, sorry, no, I want just to link to what you said now, because I think it's very important. I, I also do think that in fact these kind of strategies or you know, uh, models of representation, whatever you want to call it, I mean, we need to in fact now more than before, but nevertheless, I mean, also before units were actually going across them, uh, not seeing them as seagulls, but really as a, a, com a complex, you use the word complexity, yeah? you need to really bring everything together. So being a service provider, but at the same time, don't forget about that you have to mobilize your members. That's another important thing, which was passed, well, is part, important part of the past, the subordinated workers, is part of the autonomy and the independence. I mean, if you don't, if you don't agree, you go on strike. Now the question is, how do we do with this particular group? And to what extent, in fact, new actors uh, will be able to put these people, if they don't like what they are actually getting, we go on, you know, we go on strike. So that's why coalition building is, I think, again, a, a very nice yeah, solution, well, yeah, solution of respective trajectory. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we have to close yes. this, this part of the session. I think it's very important. So uh, we talked about social network. Uh, the, the idea of functional equivalence stands out. So it's about coalition building. It's about the importance of the servicing model and, and also ways in which you interact and sort of work together with, with these uh, with these workers and you can relate to them. Sort of use mutualism, but you can also do it through the market. But uh, in any case. The question is how you sort of also build some sort of a uh, um, uh, voice in a way and, 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 and leverage for, for them as a group beyond the individual. Well, I think all these things came out of the, of the, uh, uh, of the research and then with, with the next session, I think we, we move towards uh, further towards by that. So I give it back to you now. <coughs>
presented, so I go rather uh, fast. Uh, my task is to present uh, firstly what we did with one of the outputs. Yeah, can you hear? Yeah. One of the outputs of this uh, complex research project was to produce a catalog of practices. So uh, what we did was to select a number of practices among the 29 cases that were described uh, before collected in the nine countries that were uh, involved in our research. They were collected by country experts <coughs> through interviews, test analysis, and so on. Uh, how do, well, we, we do not call them anymore good practices <laughs> because there were a lot of very interesting good practices among those collected. We just selected uh, a number of so-called representative practices of what is being done by these different organizations, both traditional ones, unions, and uh, new organizations, POSA unions, LMIs, cooperatives and so on. And uh, the, the criteria in order to select these uh, practices was to uh, identify exempt for promoting new innovative and uh, effective actions with high coverage of IPROS, with high political visibility and with influence on policy decision, especially through coalition building. Uh, also, Practices showing new forms of promoting the mobilization of workers and the active participation of workers. This was 